So I mm-hmm. lived in South Charlotte. I'm just a country dude, right? I lived in the country. I'm from a town with like a couple thousand people. All night I hear gunshots. I hear sirens. I hear police. I hear <laughs> trains. I'm like, it's like an episode can, of cops. Like, can we move somewhere else? Do we have to live here? Hi, I'm Brent Wentz, and you're watching a Derek Persigliano show. <laughs> Did I get it right? Can I drive you? Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Derek Persiglio show. And we have got Brent Wentz with us. He is the owner of Days Gone By Apparel. He's also won the Daytona 500 twice and the Indy 500, and that's kind of like the uh, the double crown for you, isn't it? Yeah, I don't. Uh... I don't know many people that have done it, so uh, it's a great accomplishment um, to be crossing over from IndyCar to NASCAR. Uh, 25 years in the sport, um, you know, just it's amazing to see the difference in, you know, your NASCAR racing compared to your IndyCar racing. There's different thought processes, different kind of racing, different aspects of the sport. Uh, just to, to knock off those two wins is is pretty incredible as a as a race fan as a as a person that's been in racing his whole life right i mean you grew up on the short tracks and then end up with the daytona five two daytona 500 rings is a dream come true for any kid that came from the saturday night racing yeah i mean when you when you're at mahoning valley speedway as a, a little kid watching your dad race or just playing with matchbox cars in the dirt not really watching your dad race but you know, to, to climb that ladder and and think, you know, maybe I could, you know, be a professional race car driver or work in racing or anything like that. You, you get to that point and you're, you set steps, right? It's Mm -hmm. just about goals. And those are goals that you maybe never thought you'd reach, you know? And then you get to those goals and it's like, you have to kind of pinch yourself, you know, you're, you're in victory lane and in Daytona at the Daytona 500. Like, did, did you ever think that was going to happen? Get any higher. Yeah. Than that. Yeah. And not only to do it once, but <clears throat> twice. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, we had a good program at Roush Fenway with Matt Kenseth and our speedway stuff was really good. And he was a really good speedway racer. We won the first one because it rained, right? It was a mm-hmm. rain shortened race, but, you put yourself in that position. You knew it was going to rain, mm-hmm. so you had to get to the front. And he had a fast car yeah, in that race. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we just passed Elliot Sadler just right at the right time, mm-hmm. and then it started raining, and it didn't go back. So, and then everybody's like, "Oh, it rained." You know, it's a mulligan, right? So, winning in 2012, just winning, set the bar even higher. Right, it justified you, the first one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not that the first one didn't count, right? But people are still gonna say, "Oh, well." you know rain you know but wins a win yeah bottom, yeah. bottom line man yeah. wins a win yeah that's what you i know? say Screw yeah it. and i mean we partied that night we you know and we got home at six o'clock in the morning or flew out at six o'clock in the morning and we had to go right back to work because the next race was california so your truck has to leave tuesday morning so you're you're at work monday just half you know in the Cocked. bag yeah, yeah. Half I mean, in you're, the bag. You're, you're just trying to get your stuff in the, <laughs> you're trying to get your stuff in the box and head to california and you're still like half in the bag you know so it's like man when we get to california we need to look this stuff over really good when we get there but uh yeah there wasn't t- much time to celebrate uh 2012 is when juan hit the uh jet dryer mm-hmm. uh, so we got home really late from that one too and it was like you know he he you didn't get to really celebrate that when you just went right back to work. So yeah, thus is NASCAR racing, just work, work, work. You know? and, and then won the Indy 500 in 2020, right? Who did you win that with? Uh, Takuma Sato with mm-hmm. uh, Ray Hall Letterman. Um, another deal where you couldn't write the script. You know, I, I worked with Team Penske for eight years. I was a car chief on the Xfinity program and covid showed up in 2020 uh unfortunately there was a mass layoff Mm -hmm. um i just happened to be one of them you know i I thought you know the greatest place i thought i ever worked you know with the greatest owner and you know everything was just good and uh it just so happened i was one of the lucky contestants to get uh laid off Mm -hmm. and global pandemic will do that too and then it was more of a blessing in disguise now that i think about it way back I would never have the opportunities to go to the Indy 500, 
not as a fan, not as anything. I mm-hmm. would watch the Indy 500 from the Coca-Cola 600 every year in the garage area. I'd look at that big screen on the backstretch, and we'd watch the Indy 500. I never thought I'd be at the Indy 500, let alone working the Indy 500. And mm-hmm. then win the damn thing? Like, I, I, I'm probably still in shock now. Right. But you should have saw me that that day. Like, we... The race finished under caution. I was like, oh, it's going to be a green-white checkered, right? Like, I'm thinking NASCAR rules, green-white checkered. Right, they don't do that. Right. Well, and then an official comes up to me, and he, like, puts his arm around me. I'm like, I'm like, man, we are, we're f- He's <laughs> like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, we are terrible on restarts. We're terrible on restarts. I said, we're going to get smoked on this green-white checkered. Right. <laughs> and he's like, this ain't NASCAR, bud. He said, you just get that thing around two more times under caution and he said you win the indy 500 i was like wow you know like you know the next day you're you're well you're in victory lane and the next day you're kissing the bricks and you know it's it's just a crazy story uh you know i gotta you know thank like mike herman i mean mike herman and glenn mcgowan are two guys that kind of made it happen because when i got laid off i was like you know what i gotta do something different Mm -hmm. 23 years into NASCAR racing is starting to get repetitive. I get laid off by telephone. I want to do something different. After 23 years, you know, to be laid off by telephone, it hurts. Yeah. 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 I I get that. Yeah. So I was just, you know, I was pissed off, you know, sad. You know, I didn't, I didn't know which way to go after that. And I called Mike Herman and I said, you know, any late model guys around the North Carolina area that might need a, spotter because i've always second spotted throughout my career Mm -hmm. uh you know at penske at roush all these places that wasn't your main job that wasn't my main job what was your main job uh, i was a mechanic for probably 15 years and then i became a car chief Mm -hmm. and uh but i would still spot on sundays you know second spot at indianapolis from the pagoda Watkins Glen, sonoma all the road courses Mm -hmm. so it was something i always like to do so i was like you know what? maybe i could make somewhat of a career doing it and what better time now than now you know mm-hmm. so i called mike and he's like you get get a resume ready get a resume ready um he's like i don't care if you can freaking weld i don't care if you can set up a car i don't care just spotting i was like okay so lo and behold there was an opening at ray hall letterman for that 30 car with sato for the 500 well it got filled that day, so I didn't get the job. So, okay, there's okay. more to the story, yeah. right? So I don't get the job. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, man, Indy 500, I missed out on that. That would have been cool. Uh, about five days later, I get a phone call. The guy that they picked for the job owned a dirt late model or something in Virginia, also spotted, got in a fight after the race in Virginia at this local track Uh and got punched in the eye and busted up his retina in his eye. So he can't spot. So now this is three weeks before the Indy 500. I get the phone call from RLL. We looked at your resume. Do you want to come work? Do you want to come work on our third car that we're going to have? I said, no. They're like, all right, well, you can come spot. You know, I said, yeah, that's what I want to do. So never spotted an Indy car race in my life. First I, time at the 500. First time at the 500. First time at an Indy car race. First time for everything. <laughs> thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, I got paired up. You have two spotters there, one in turn one, one in turn three. I was in turn three. The main spotter's in turn one. You split the track in half. Ray Brisky, who's the spotter for Takuma, very seasoned guy, mm-hmm. took me under his wing. And it was flawless from the time we started to the time we kissed them bricks. So after that was over, I sat in the airport that Tuesday morning, mm-hmm. pretty much cried a right. little bit. I would like, have, I would have I, cried right there. Yeah, at so the like, track. Oh my you know, God. Like, like I'm just sitting there all by myself <clears throat> thinking about what I've done in my career. Mm-hmm. What do you want to do next? figure it out in terminal a of the Indianapolis airport right now. Mm -hmm. And that's when I did. I said, 
you know, screw it. I'm just going to figure out how to spot as a career, whether it's freelance and whether it's with a team full time, whatever. And that's when I made my decision was that Tuesday after the 500 that I wasn't going back working, you know, in, in the sport that I truly loved for right 20 some years because you know working on those cars as a mechanic during the course of a weekend yeah it's it's a grind yeah man. and it, you know yeah it's it's hard work you miss uh, they make it seem like if if you miss a race if you miss a day of work they make it feel like your toolbox will be moved out the next day because you missed a day that's just the, the aura of the sport and I missed funerals I missed weddings I missed too many things that I can't go back and and do all over again mm-hmm. now when you think about it now you wish that you just would have said screw it and just go do that stuff but that's things you you can't you can't take back mm-hmm. and that's the you know uh, it's kind of the sad part about the sport is it takes it's your life your your life revolves around racing mm-hmm. so. it becomes the lifestyle it, yeah. it really it does yeah. I, I know I lived it for years yeah. too on the road I, I mean I was flying and traveling from 2002 to 2020 so yeah, yeah I understand yeah uh, it, you miss a lot of stuff yep. you do um, yeah and yeah. you can't you can't get it back yeah I know. It's the sad part about it is you, you, you dedicate your life to it. And then, and then everybody, even the best people, you look at some of these crew chiefs that were winning crew chiefs, championship crew chiefs, championship car chiefs, you're replaceable, mm-hmm. unfortunately. And, and, and that's what it is. You're, it's a performance based business. Yeah. That's the other thing too. Yeah. And they want to see. You performing not just on the track, but you know, getting the cars through the track. Yeah, I, yeah. I get it. Yeah, it's uh, it's tough. It, the sport can eat you up and uh, spit you out sometimes. Yeah. That's yeah. for sure. And and thankfully, I found another way to be <clears throat> involved in this sport that I'm close enough to it to enjoy it, mm-hmm. but far enough away from it that I don't have to deal with the the the, the BS, right? Uh, of it, you do know. you miss working on the cars or turning uh, wrenches or what, anything? What I do miss is the competition part, mm-hmm. um, making your car better, mm-hmm. finding the gray areas, cheating, getting away with, you know, the best feeling. Innovating, innovating, innovating not yeah. cheating. Innovating. Yeah, innovating. Right. Yeah, the best feeling in the world is when you see that car roll off the grid onto the track behind a pace car. And you know that you got away with 15 gray area, innovative <laughs> things. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I mean, I used to have a list of 20 things that you would do before a race. You know, now it's qualify or practice qualify impound, right? So mm-hmm. you can't tweak your car. You can't do fun things to it. And I used to have a list of 20, 25 things that you would do to the car. As the car chief. Yeah. Okay. That you would do to the car to, you know, innovation, gray areas. And they would find a few obvious things that you would put on the car that would make them go right to that. Right. Mm -hmm. Make, make a couple things. Here, chase after this bone. Yeah. Right. Make a couple things obvious that are easy to fix, fix it, roll back around (laughs) through tech. And then you're like, Oh, that's, great you know he fixed it right up thanks and then roll that thing to the grid and watch it roll off and then just laugh some of the things that i had heard over the years were amazing i had heard guys drilling um uh holes in the the shock shafts and then putting a drill blank in there yeah because as soon as the car hit the the banking or something the weight would just break the drill blank Uh, uh, what was the other one I heard? Ice wedges in the yeah, springs. Yeah, ice wedges. Right. Or, you know, we used to use like lava soap mm-hmm. to put under the pigtails of the of the springs to hold it up through tech. <laughs> and then the heat of the engine and everything would just melt the soap and <laughs> the thing would just fall right to the ground, right? So the only problem with some of these like they zero... smell? Zero, well, like the zero rate springs and things like that, you have a hard time getting a thing back to 
tech height after the race. So you're constantly reaching into the, you know, grabbing the shifter lever, putting your back on the halo bar, and kind of just like lifting the car up as you go through tech after the race, trying to, <laughs> and then sometimes them suckers are just on the ground and it's like, you know, Greg Irwin was our crew chief at Penske on the Xfinity side. And it's like, dude, you're going to get suspended for this. Can we, I can't get, I can't get the car back up to height. You mm-hmm. know, he's like, Oh, come on, man. I'm like, can't do it. Oh, can't man. do it. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, the old, the old modified trick, pulling them across the scales. Yeah. You pull up yeah, on, yeah, the nerve, yeah. you pull up on yeah, the nerve yeah. bar while yeah. it's going on yeah. to get the thing up yeah. as high as it can. Yeah. Now, like with the cool bound stuff that they do there, I watch some of those modifieds go across the, the, the plate or whatever. And it's like some of them things that, left side rail is just on the ground they can't, right. you know, they, some, they can't get them <laughs> things up either you're lucky you're lucky to that they can put their little gauge under there quick right you know and, but it's just part of the sport right that's innovation that's making your garage area better than the next guy next to you making your changes in the garage seconds faster than the guy so you can make more practice laps like that's the stuff that I do miss. But now with spotting, I do things that are innovative for me, whether it's how I design my case for my my stuff or how I design my stickers for my railing or how I approach the weekends with maps and, 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 and things like that. Like mm-hmm. there's still ways that you can be innovative in anything you do. It doesn't it doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be racing, you mm-hmm. know. But you can still use that mindset that you use for decades doing something else in racing. Now, um, what are some of the teams that you'll be spotting for this year? What series, which drivers? Yep. So I do uh, the IndyCar ovals for Junkos Hollinger with a column a lot. He's a former F1 reserve driver for Alfa Romeo. It's his second year. Um, So we'll do all the ovals. We've done Texas already. Indy 500 will be next. They fly around. Oh, That is just stupid fast. It was a, like this year was, I felt the Texas race was awesome. Mm -hmm. There was, you know, there was actually two lanes, you know, usually you're just stuck to the bottom, Mm -hmm. but there was, I I, like when you can enjoy a race Mm -hmm. and not just be like, Oh, glad that, freaking thing is over a lot of those guys don't like doing those old oh with yeah indy cars yeah right? i mean our rookie test it's like jet fighters on the pavement man yes. it's uh, it's sick yeah our rookie test last year column was never on an oval he's a you know street course road course guy from across the pond so we get to texas for this test and he picks it up pretty quick and then after the first day i go down i'm like yeah, how how was it you know these guys talk about how fast it is and He's like, oh, mate. He said, it's just super fast, super fast. I said, yeah, yeah. He goes, I made a mistake. He said, I'm just driving, and I'm looking at the white line, the whole test, just looking at that solid white line. He says, I looked up at the wall, and, you know, the wall changes colors. He says, I was like, oh, back to the white line. Because <laughs> then <laughs> you know how fast you're really going when the right. when the wall's changing colors. But, uh yeah, IndyCar, and then uh, 2311 with uh, Bubba Wallace at all the road courses. Uh, oh, okay. I do J- usually Freddie Kraft does Fred, uh, yep, his stuff, too. Yep. Freddie's a great guy. Oh, yeah. I, man, yeah, I, yeah. I've known him from the Riverhead yeah. Raceway days, and we were yeah. all kids. You yeah. know, uh, I started racing uh, or actually announcing at a track called uh, Medford Raceway, yep. which was off the Long Island Expressway, and the Crafts would come, and they would come and play and race yeah. and everything. I yeah. used to watch his father race yeah. figure eights, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, Riverhead, and, like, I guess – you know, like I didn't know Freddie that well till about a couple, you know, year, a couple years ago, mm-hmm. but he, I think the modified connection, the local short track connection, mm-hmm. you know, he called me last year and I was like, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll help at all, all the road courses and help him out. And, uh, so yeah, I do all the 2311 stuff with Freddie, um, junior motorsports. Um, I do Miguel Paludo's road course races and then, the nine or the one at the non companions, which is Portland and Road America. Didn't you win the championship yeah. in the nation in Xfinity series? Yeah. I worked at back? JRM on the nine car with Chase Elliott. Okay. The the first year, the inception of that team with Greg Ives and Travis Mack and all those guys. We mm-hmm. you know, the deal came together. I was at Roush for probably eight years and uh they shoved another three year contract in front of me and I just 
I didn't want to stay. Mm-hmm. You know, Matt had left and gone to Gibbs. And, you know, sometimes you can see the writing on the wall. If you're around long enough, you can kind of see where the pace of the team is going. So I gave them their three year contract back. And, well, Penske was after me to be a car chief there. Mm-hmm. Well, that door closed pretty quick. So they told me to find a job kind of without contract obligations. So I went to JRM and I was there for a year. We won the championship, won a couple of races. Uh, As a car chief, right? I was a mechanic. Oh, okay. uh, Travis Mack was the uh, car chief. Okay, gotcha. I mean, we had a group of people that could all be car chiefs, so it was a very solid group of guys. Mm-hmm. A lot of experience, per se. Uh, yeah, and then we won the championship, and then that November, right after the banquet and um, down in Miami, I moved my toolbox over to Penske and I started my car chief kind of career over at Penske. So, yeah. The car chief level is like the highest you can go without the engineering degree, yeah, right? Yeah, Nowadays, because yeah. now it's all engineering. Yeah, and I mean, right? there's a couple people that have been car chiefs that have made it to a crew chief level. You know, that's not the best path mm-hmm. per se this time, of you know, this time in racing, but a lot of people have you know there's a couple alan gustafson was a car chief mm-hmm. uh travis mack at track house he was a car chief uh, there's there's a you know a couple but did they have the engineering degree nope. oh they nope. didn't just okay. racing just now what racers. is it about the engineering degree that is like you know the well i just feel like there's a lot of you know the sim there's a lot of simulation stuff there's a lot of uh, you know you could you can run a couple laps on your computer as a engine engineer right so like you got to do a lot of seven posts a lot of k rig a lot of a lot of stuff that i mean basically anybody can learn that right mm-hmm. you, you're not blocked from learning how to do that so i just feel like you're a little having that engineering degree you're just a step above what other people aren't, you know, so you don't have to learn it. You, you plug and play and you're already in there. Cool. Yep. So let's go back to some roots now. Uh, you said Mahoning Valley was your home track, yep. uh, the short track. So you kind of grew up around that Mahoning Valley, Evergreen uh, area. Yep. Uh, what other tracks were around that area? Yeah, um, Wall Stadium. Wall Stadium, um, okay. Flemington. Um, I raced at Flemington. Yeah. Have you ever, well, I don't know if you raced there, but... No. Uh, I raced at Flemington in a midget a couple of times. That place is scary. Oh, yeah. I, I think I almost saw my dad get killed there. Um, it was a heat race um, coming off turn one, got turned. He was second maybe. And Tony Siscone was like fifth probably. And they come around, you know, the, the inside Armco there with a modified, you can't really see what's around the next corner because you're so low. And my dad was sitting there kind of sideways in the middle of the track and Siscone hit him right in the left side header. And I mean, the engine was just laying, laying out of the car. I'm just, you know, I'm a 11, 12 year old kid just in the stands by myself. Cause I can't get in the pits cause it's New Jersey. Right. Right. And I just like the hit was, you could just hear the crack and I can just remember seeing it like, Oh my God, you know, but everybody got out and walked away. But that was one of my most favorite, tracks i think and for the viewers and the listeners that are listening or watching at home flemington speedway was a square five eighths of a mile track it it literally had four individual corners but it had armco walls on the inside and the outside so it was a blind corner you were running into and you're running down the straightaways at 130 30 140 miles an hour yeah into a blind corner at least when we ran the midgets there we could see the wing up above the cage so if you know a car got sideways the wing got sideways so we knew but in a modified or a late model it was roll the dice yeah and then they had you know the race of champions and the challenge of champions races there and Mm -hmm. you know they they had the foam blocks you know and people would hit them and the thing it would snow for (laughs) there'd be freaking you know styrofoam everywhere but yeah, as a kid, that was one of my favorite places to go, other than, you know, my home track, Mahoning Valley, which was only 10 minutes from my house, which I still call that my home track. And I've I've been lucky enough to race Modifieds there and a couple other places. And, you know, it's just I've never raced week to week. You know, it was always like race and then five months later race or a year later race. I was going to ask, how long did you drive? Yeah, I mean, just sporadically for probably eight years just – here and there, mm-hmm. you know, we'd, 
Watkins Glen, when we'd race up there, we'd bring two cars up to Shangri-La. Uh, you know, if I was home for Pocono, we'd, mm-hmm. we'd race that Saturday night, you know, and, and just when it was convenient with my schedule to try to, to do it. Um, but there's nothing better than, than, than driving a, a modified. I don't, I don't, I don't think there's probably anything better. I don't know. You got to try hopping in a midget. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cars well, yeah. That's well, a wild ride. I, man. I've become really good friends with Brian Brown. Uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. and I'll catch up with them guys on the, on their tours throughout the country. And I, I always tell him, I'm like, if I just wanted to drive something, I just want to be you for five laps. I just want to have your talent right. and just, sit in there and go and, and see what it was like. Cause right. I watch those guys and I think whew, I'm not sure I have the balls to, to do what they do at old Dora and Knoxville and these Volusia and like flat footed. Oh yeah. yeah. It's crazy. Right. I know. Yeah. You know, it was fo- funny because we were talking about Flemington. I, I went to Flemington when it was both dirt and pavement. So I got to see the outlaws there at Flemington and, uh, Watching Doug Wolfgang set like a one lap track record there one night was amazing. Oh, yeah. It was like 148 miles an yeah. hour, and he just never lifted. Yeah. He, they pushed him off, and he just whoo, yeah. for two laps. Yeah. And you never heard yeah, that like engine they used, up. They used to run Syracuse, you know, that's super fast. I think Billy Pouch still owns the the, the record at Syracuse for the mm-hmm. fastest lap in a in a in a race car. So. Yeah, them guys just they're just built a little bit different. So you grew up on the short tracks at Mahoning Valley. Your dad raced modifieds, right? Yep. Um, it was a was it a family operation? Yep. yep. Okay. Yep. So, Still is. Okay. Yep. So yeah. dad dad raced. You worked on the cars. Yeah. I which way know, was where you get your skill set yeah, from? Yeah. Right. Yep. And I had my my brother Matt. He raced full time, like my dad, my brother, and I just I was my brothers are ten and eleven years older than me, so I was kind of behind on the you know the the racing train a little bit i was playing football i was playing baseball i was doing kid stuff Mm -hmm. while they were already you know behind the wheel racing so it took me a little while i mean i moved down here north carolina when i was 17 so right out of high school and so i didn't i was either family come down too so you came down here by at 17 yeah so wait, first off, and what year was this? Nineteen ninety nine. Ninety nine. So your parents just said, "Go, go ahead." Yep. Yeah. So I knew one person down here. It was my cousin uh, Kevin Mooney, who worked for Street and Smith Productions, like Inside NASCAR. Those kind Kevin of... Mooney is your cousin. Yeah, yes. Do you know yeah. how many years my I worked with Kevin yeah. and Chris Stevens, yeah, our, yeah, our yeah, producer, yeah. worked with yeah. Kevin. So Kevin's my cousin. They shot a whole bunch of stuff yeah. together. So I w- lived with Kevin. He worked at Street and Smiths, mm-hmm. um, which later became NASCAR yeah, Images. Yep, NASCAR Images. So I mm-hmm. lived in South Charlotte, in this podunk freaking apartment complex on south boulevard was it waterford lakes it was oh no i don't even know I, <laughs> that's where chris I, lived <laughs> I, I don't know what it was called uh, the beacon hill apartments is what it was beacon hill so there was like a hooters down the street like a place a mexican a, uh, a mexican place where yeah. i got my hair cut there was like a jersey mike's he's like, in my ear saying i know right oh, where yeah. he lives. so like yeah. I'm in this apartment complex and <laughs> I, I, I hear like, I'm just a country dude, right? I lived in the country. I'm from a town with like a couple thousand people. And I like all night I hear gunshots. I hear sirens. I hear police. I hear <laughs> trains. I'm like, it's like an episode can, of cops. Like, can we move somewhere else? Do we have to live here? Right. But it was convenient to street and Smith's cause I was right off 77 off that. He, well, he was never home too. I right. Mean, he was traveling yeah. every oh, weekend yeah. as even, a shooter. Yeah. Even better. I was by myself most of the time, but, uh, yeah. So that is, a, I such moved a down small world. And, and the reason we ended up moving from the beacon Hill is one day I walked out in the morning to go to work. I worked at innovative motorsports. That was my first job. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mike Grichy was the crew chief there. Um, another great guy. Yeah. Yeah. So he was my, my first guy that hired me and I walked out of my apartment one morning and there's a couple Hispanic guys and they were all dressed in little trees, racing clothing. (laughs) And I'm like, (laughs) I work on a little trees car (laughs) and I'm like, these suckers stole my clothes out of the laundromat, obviously. (laughs) And I'm like, they're te- it's team-issued clothing. I'm like, 
I got to get out of here. I see guys are stealing my clothes out of the dryer at the apartment. Did you, you, know? did you tell him, hey, uh, hey I, that's no, my shirt? No, he no. was like, nah. No, I just let him have it. I was, so when you got to work, would you tell him that was, yeah, a bunch of guys stole my yeah, clothes? I, I mean, that's what I did. And I, I told Kevin, I said, can we move? Like, So we ended up moving to Huntersville to, you know, Burkdale kind of over there. That's but so funny. Oh, yeah. It's, it, I said, well, welcome to Charlotte. People are already wearing your clothes, stealing your clothes. So, uh, yeah, I mean... That 17 so years funny. old just being down here in this the city life kind of deal and mm-hmm. just trying to learn the ropes and you know my my first couple of years of racing i i learned the ropes the hard way um as most know, do yeah i mean late for work stuck in traffic you know not not putting 100 percent towards what i was doing and you know luckily greachy hired me there i mean I almost just moved back home. Mm -hmm. Um, I went to Bobby Isaac Motorsports Technology School in Hickory just to build a resume. Mm -hmm. And I just went through looms of paper, you know, resume after resume after resume. And I thought, I'll just hand a resume to somebody and somebody's going to hire me. Well, that's not how it works. Mm -hmm. Uh, This girl that was friends with my cousin, Kevin, her name was Tracy. I remember I was just going to move back home. I was like, screw it. I'll just go work in my dad's body shop like my brother's. Mm -hmm. And we were at Midtown Sundries in Huntersville, and we're eating dinner. And this Tracy lady's like, "Did you find a job yet?" I'm like, "No, nobody's called me. I don't, whatever. I'm gonna move back home." She she proceeded to scream at me at the dinner table, and told me, "This is when the NASCAR Papyrus uh, video game, mm-hmm. computer game, was pretty popular." Right. And I'd spend all night playing that and she's like get off your computer mm-hmm. and get to these shops and talk to these people i said oh well okay yeah I, I was. so she, she made you straight she's yelled at me in front of all these people mm-hmm. i'm like oh okay yeah next morning grabbed a couple of resumes started going to shops at 5 30 in the morning six o'clock in the morning when they're opening the gates, when people are just pulling in. And that's what I did with Grichi. I innovative motorsports. I was at the door when they were opening the doors mm-hmm. and I did it three days in a row. And the third day he was like, come on in, let's sit down. And he hired me that day. I mean, it was for pennies, right? but that's what it took. It took somebody to yell at me and Give you a kick in the ass. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is this is what it's gonna be, mm-hmm. and it just you know just happened to be a a lady that was just I didn't really know her, but she she set me straight, mm-hmm. and thankfully for her that lasted. Well, it's still going now, twenty four years later. So uh, it's been know. an amazing run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, but, now, but something that almost didn't happen. Right. So now living down here all these years, now married, kids. Yes, I have uh, my wife, Kim, and Mm -hmm. uh, my son, Axel. He's uh, 13. Um, We, you know, we we tried to have babies and tried to do, you Mm -hmm. know, all that. And we we went through the IVFs and we went through all this. We went a year of just a lot of money, Mm -hmm. probably $50,000 worth of money, trying to do all this, you know, fertility stuff. And uh, we ended up adopting... But then that stuff didn't work. We ended up having a, unfortunately we, we, it took once mm-hmm. and uh, we ended up having a miscarriage. Oh, um, so, sorry to hear that. well, it's just, you know, trial and error. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, mm-hmm. but you go through that and you spend all that money and all you're ending up with is it's either going to be good or it's going to be bad. Right. So we ended up paying all that money just to be, have an emotional roller coaster, right. you know, and, the doctor was like, we'll do it one more time. We'll do it one more time. And I said, no, I'm, I'm freaking done. Right. I'm done writing freaking checks. I'm done. You, you got, it's starting to be an emotional roller coaster for my wife. You're kind of not ruining her body a little bit in, you know, like with all the injections. Uh-huh. I said, so we're going to go a different route. So we went the adoption route. Um, we ended up adopting Axel. He was two years old. You know, people talk about adoption and how you get from overseas and things like that. Mm-hmm. Axel is from Greensboro, 
North Carolina. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, cool. it ended up to be a local deal, and it couldn't be any more happier with the way everything turned out. You know, we're, we're years, we're a decade into it now, and, uh, you know, we're still on a list to maybe do it again. It's just a very populated list so you know? one one child yeah one child yep. okay very yep. cool yeah so <laughs> he does his own thing you know he i'm not gonna push him to like racing mm-hmm. you know uh i was never pushed to like racing i had my choice of sports baseball football whatever i chose racing because mm-hmm. it's just what i liked you know i would go to the races in my baseball uniform or in my football uniform, right? right, To get there in time. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to push my Does he at least think it's cool? Yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, now what about like going racing with him? You ever thought about go-karts or outlaw karts? There's a couple people at, there's a couple people at Millbridge that have like, you know, outlaw carts and things like that that yeah. you know hey come bring them over like you i'm know. the communications director yeah, yeah. at mountain creek come yeah, on yeah, out yeah. to our track yeah. yeah i mean we have a little uh I have eight acres of land at my house and a really? couple acres of it is underneath power lines so i cut in a racetrack okay down there and we have go-karts flat carts oh cool and I gotta you know, come to your house and play. Yeah, one yeah, time. yeah. So he, <laughs> so he like rips around. He would rip around there a little bit, you know. But he's just still. I think he's still trying to find his niche mm-hmm. in, in in what he wants to do. So, you know, let him a, uh, let him let him do his own thing for a little while, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. Uh, take him to a yeah. race or something. Be like, you want to give this a shot? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I think he like you Go can tell when somebody if a kid has what it takes to race Mm -hmm. like even if it's just in a flat cart on your backyard right you can see car control you can see throttle control you can see the focus if they have it or they Mm -hmm. don't he has it it's just does he want to do it might keep pursuing it yeah yeah. well you know what i I mean at 13 years old it's a little late to get started nowadays it is it wasn't when i started you know but uh you never too late look at william byron right yeah i mean incredible yeah so Besides that, when you also own Days Gone By clothing and apparel, yep. right? Or uh, vintage apparel. Yep. Really cool stuff. I see it all the time. Dale Jr. is constantly commenting on the stuff that you have because oh, yeah. he's a historian. Oh, yeah. He oh, digs yeah. that, yeah, that yeah. old stuff. So do I. Yep. You know, uh, what I dig though is that you kind of remind me of like a Matt Dillner type in the way that you appreciate the history of this sport. Yep. And and I think that is really cool. So yep. let's take a look at some of the stuff that you brought with you yeah. today. Let's, yeah, we uh, got to check this out. We got a couple of things. You guys got the, uh, you know, Mahoning Valley is my home track. So I, I used to collect a lot of things that were just close to home. Mm-hmm. And that's what started the whole, you know, the whole deal was finding cool stuff from home right you know and we got hat, hats from this is cool doug hoffman you know doug hoffman doug was hoffman a, of was course a, was a big guy oh, up yeah, there the in Pennsylvania. 60 over team so we my dad actually was we were good friends with the huffmans That's uh, cool. we have one of his nomads after he you know he tragically you know passed away a few years ago mm-hmm. but we have i have fire suits of of, of dougs and stuff in my house you really? know and and uh, we have one of his cars from his car collection my dad owns. So, yeah, I just try to find... Now, you get this apparel, but you also sell it. Yeah. Right? Oh, you yeah. have, like, oh, an yeah. online store, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, most of this stuff I have today is from my personal collection. <laughs> you know, uh, the, the rest of the stuff you can see on my Etsy store, you know. But right. uh, a lot of the cool things, you know, you got... You know, Richie Evans. Ah, oh, that's awesome. You I know, haven't seen one of those yeah. hats in a long yeah. time. The old trucker-style yeah. hats, too. So, uh, Matt Dillner would be chomping at the bit oh, yeah. to get this. Well, yeah. He probably has one, knowing him. Yeah, yeah. That and the Charlie Jazomback hat. Yeah, we. That's awesome. So you know, it's like I've never, I never watched Richie Evans race, but I've watched enough highlights and read books and worked with Richie Jr. and you know, <laughs> Richie's great. Yeah, so I like, I feel like I, I know those people, and and when I find certain stuff, I feel like if they don't have it already i'll offer it to them Mm -hmm. because i feel like if you found something of my family's racing heritage that you would maybe give it to me and i've given a lot of stuff to families Mm -hmm. uh you know certain stuff has a price right like you just can't give it away but you know certain things are just nonchalant 
Here I gotta go. go. I gotta go on your site and get a, a couple of shirts for yeah, this show because yeah, yeah. that's our thing on this show. Yeah. You know, we is bench racing, so we don't like to wear like you know the the golf shirt. We wear what you'd wear yeah. at the racetrack: oh, yeah. a t-shirt and jeans. And yeah. you know, anybody who sends me a shirt will like Ryan Lagoda sent me this. So yeah, yeah. sure. I'll wear but it I mean, on if air. we like, I don't just do local stuff. I do NASCAR stuff. So you got, you know, the old Dale Earnhardt nineteen oh, yeah. eighties. You know, <laughs> that's awesome. Live it to the limit. You know, we got that. So and that is original too. Let yeah, me see oh the yeah. tag. Look at oh the yeah. tag on this thing. Yep. You can tell by the old tag on it. Holy cow! Yeah, that is amazing. And just by the old style font that they used. Yeah, you and can always tell the old shirts. And no dot com anywhere. No dot com. <laughs> no dot. No dot com. And that's people awesome. people always ask me. They're like, "Do you reprint shirts?" I'm like. No, this is all original stuff. Right. Like, I'm not a, I don't reproduce anything. If you want the real stuff, you know, Ryan Blaney is probably 95% of the reason that I started doing this. I built my house and I built my shop. He wanted to come over and check out the lay of the land one day. Mm -hmm. And I had just a 12 by 12 box with old stuff in it. Troyer shirt stuff from up home modified stuff and he loved it and he was like whoa what's in that box i'm like oh, just a bunch of shit a bunch of junk yeah and he's like starts ripping through it and he's like what are you doing with it i said oh, pff, we just moved man the stuff's in boxes <laughs> he's like well i'm going in the bathroom i'm gonna try it on so he he's like i, I want to buy it all how much i said well, i don't know you you want to buy it you tell me how much you want to pay right you know and he whips out his wallet and I'm like, oh, yeah, you can yeah. have it all. Take the whole box. Mm -hmm. You can even have the box. Right. You know, and then he drove <laughs> out of there with his Bronco, and and he left that day. And I'm like, I see this stuff all the time. Right. I, I collect automobilia. I collect porcelain signs. I collect advertising. I gas pumps. Doors, too, right? Yep, yep. Uh, well, the, the big thing that is cool about this is the authenticity of it. Yeah. That's why people are going for yep. it because it is, you know, yeah. it's the real deal. And you're it's never, not reprinted. Yeah, you're right. never going to find stuff like that. It's one of one or it's one of ten or one of five. Right. Right? So... I got a couple more. Let's check some out. I mean, this has got to be over 30 years old right here. Yeah. Wow. Now, what is What do we this got here? This one here is my dad's Should shirt. Ca camera's right there. Yep. Yeah. My dad's shirt from just... <laughs> uh, Mahoning Valley Speedway in uh, 1989. So, you know, it doesn't fit me very well anymore. I've gained a couple pounds since <laughs> then. But, uh, yeah, I mean. Look at that. Gary Wentz. That's your dad. Huh? Yeah. So those are two Richie Evans chassis cars. Are they? Yeah. Okay. That's what we ran back in the day. And mm -hmm. uh, so I have a couple RE cars in my shop right now. Built by Billy Nazowitz or yep. by Richie? Because they both built yep. cars. So yeah. the one is a Richie and one is a Richie Nazowitz. Okay. So I have. In your shop right now. I have Mario Fiore's B-Bomb. 44 car b-bomb b-bomb was their backup car kind of like their short track car so the teddy bear pools car yep. the yep. blue one i have it it's in my shop it's getting i'm in the middle of restoring it now no kidding and, I, and I, my my thing is is do i want to teddy bear pools is how i recognize the mario fiori reggio reggio era mm -hmm. so that's what i want to make it mm -hmm. but then i see the Greg Sachs, 46 City Chevrolet car that they ran at Shangri-La. The Miller Lite car was or the, hot, or too. Or the Miller Lite. Yeah, it's like there's so many choices. What, But when you think of Mario Fiore and Reggie, you think of Teddy Bear Pools. Right, you think that blue it and is, white is what I think. So it's a work in progress. I, I restored a car to my dad's uh, car back in 1988 and gave it to him as a surprise. I worked on that thing for... Five years, right down. So you here. completely restored one of his modifieds. Yep. It and was gave it to him as a present. Yep, the car was actually That's Robert amazing. Jeffries from Bowman Gray, this white seventy-five. Mm -hmm. I pulled it out of his basement and restored it. It was an RE car, and they're hard to find down here. Yeah. So I just wanted an RE car to start. Mm -hmm. About five years it took me to redo this whole freaking car. And I'd have to lock my garage. Whenever my parents come down to visit, I have to lock my garage. Why can't we go in the garage? You just can't go in the garage. You just can't go in there. Well, I mean, even I'd get parts for that car 
out of my dad's parts supply in Pennsylvania <laughs> because why are you taking I, didn't, this? I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't want to buy the parts. Right. Why, like, are you, why are you grabbing that? Well, he wouldn't know. Oh. But I would get my brother. We have like a, a 24-foot storage container full of race car parts. Now there's a you know quick change rear end sitting in there, like a couple of them. I'm like, I'm not going to buy a brand new quick change for $3,000 to put in this restored car. Right. When I know there's a couple up there, so I get my brother to go in there and grab one, and my cousin, who's a truck driver, he'd just drive that thing to North Carolina and then drive back. Well, we took this quick change rear end the one time. My dad probably wasn't in that storage container for five years, right? Mm -hmm. We take that quick change rear end and bring it down here. Not four days later, (laughs) I get a phone call. My brother's like, yo, we got a problem. I said, what? He's like... Dad's looking for that rear end. I said, come on, man. I said, he ain't been in that freaking thing forever. He's like, yeah, he he knows it's gone. Right. I'm like, oh, crap. So I said, well, just tell him you know where it is. Like, he's going to get it back eventually. Like, right. Just, just tell him it's not stolen so he doesn't put out a police report or something. Oh so, God. yeah, we uh, I gave it to him as a surprise. He got inducted into the Hall of Fame and... Pennsylvania local hall of fame, like Mahoning Valley. That's and great. We, we won the championship with Chase Elliott in 2014 at Phoenix. We clinched it. I flew from Phoenix to Allentown, Pennsylvania. The car was up there. The induction ceremony was Sunday. We pulled the car in and told my dad that he was going to this induction ceremony for a guy that drove for him. Well, I have his suit. I have his helmet the car everything and i'm at the hall of fame ceremony before he gets there i'm in the car and this was just the day after winning the xfinity series so he thinks the last time he saw me probably was on tv in phoenix Mm -hmm. so he has why would i be there Mm -hmm. so we i get in the car i put the helmet on i put the suit on we put a car cover on it and people are like texting me we're five minutes away we're three minutes away and uh they get there and I can hear my dad walking around. My dad and my brother are walking around the car, like car covers on and I'm inside. And I'm like, all right, come on, let's go, let's go. I can hear him say, what's this? What's this? You know, I'm like, oh man. So we uncover that thing and he's like, you know, automatic waterfalls. He's oh, he's crying. And, and like, I, I think like my dad owned, my dad's got everything he needs. If he, if he wants it, he gets it, right? So it's hard to to find stuff to give your parents when they right. they kind of have what they need, right? right? So what better thing to do is than that? And he's looking around the car. I'm sitting in this thing. I'm wedged in there because these cars are small back then. And he doesn't even know I'm in there. Right. Like he's just walking around looking at the car. And I'm like, hey, <laughs> hey I'm in here. You know, my, he didn't look in the no, cockpit no, no, and no, see no, the no. driver? No, 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 no. no. Like, so my brother's like, pointing in there i undo the you know the old seat belt clip you mm-hmm. know and i drop the window net and i get out and then he really lost it you know and but it was cool you know like you, you know you did good when you make your parents right. cry well right? that and also he saw you win the xfinity right. championship yeah. the night yeah. before so he's all proud of yeah, you yeah, yeah, yeah. and now here you are the yeah. next day showing up in his one of his restored cars yeah, yeah. and his boy there yep. so, so that had to have been real yeah. did you have any video of it I have pictures. pictures. I don't have video, but I have you got to send them yeah. to us and show They're us. They're like, you know, it's, you know, frame by frame, you know, you can just see them getting worked up and, you know, it was cool because your parent, my, you know, everybody's parents, you did a lot for me mm-hmm. growing up, you know, without their guidance and their support and their, you know, frame of mind that helps you along your path. So I, uh, I have that car in my garage now. <laughs> but uh, we were going to do a for Darlington uh, Fox Sports was going to Matt Yoakum and Fox Sports was going to do a uh, deal before Darlington about all the old clothing mm-hmm. and we thought it would be a cool backdrop and uh, COVID hit and never happened yeah. so that car is down here in my garage I want it to go back to Pennsylvania where it belongs I didn't build it for me right you know but I get to look at it every day but it it needs to go back up there my dad has 
three body shops and I don't care centers and they all have glass showrooms in the front. So he puts oh. a classic car in the front and stuff like that. Got to put the modified. in. So there. it was Absolutely. in there. It was in there. And there was a little bit of a fire in one of the heating units at the auto care center. And it got come, you know, all the soot and stuff came out of the vents and got all over the car. So that was kind of the reason why it ended up back down there also oh for you to go through it and clean yeah, it back up yeah. again so oh, no so and that's a, you, when you have one of those soot backups oh, too it's yeah. terrible it was, man there was crap everywhere ash so everywhere it's, and yeah it's good now but it needs to go away <laughs> i'm like i didn't build this to take up room in my shop and needs to, but yeah. we have a, a car that we kind of uh he bought and it's for axel my my son it's a 69 z28 clone and it's orange with white hugger orange with white stripes Mm -hmm. so that's need that we're gonna swap here eventually we're just gonna roll back the camaro down unload it put the modify back on and we're just gonna trade (laughs) it's a good trade (laughs) that's great what other uh, what other kind of stuff you got what are you these are some this is some great material you've got daytona 500 rings we gotta break we were talking about Ah, the uh, the reg Reg, you know the danny's market uh new england uniform 44 car that's a bruce roll original i know you had him on the show a couple weeks ago and what a good dude. You know, he works at Stuart Haas now. And, I know. Uh, We're trying to get him back with his crew chief, Mark Lyon. So we gonna, okay. we got to get them together. We got It's a little bit of a scheduling issue we got to get. But once we get through it, yeah. uh, I think Reggie uh, will be uh, coming back soon. Yeah. He is the most requested guest to return. Like more than cup champions, yeah. sprint car driver. He is the number one guest we get looking at the analytics yeah. to come back on this well, show. Well, I talk about, you know, I work. When I worked at Penske, the last year I worked there, I worked on the Wood Brothers 21. Mm -hmm. The Wood Brothers 21 is a Penske car, if anybody doesn't know. Mm -hmm. The Penske employees work on it. But I got to work with Lynn and Eddie Wood. And it's just like these older drivers, they tell these stories. They were there, right? Right. They're not fabricated stories. You listen to Lynn and Eddie Wood or Reg Rogerio or Jimmy Spencer or Tommy Baldwin or all these guys... Their stories are so real. They were there. They lived it. And and you can't fabricate some of the stories that they they tell you. So I can believe that those guys would be well requested because the the, the stories they they were there. They raced. Yeah. Right. They saw it. They saw their friends get killed. They saw yeah. friends have success. Like you you can't fabricate yeah. that stuff. I mean, right? Tommy has seen the best and the worst. I mean, his father was killed at Thompson yep. and then he also won the Daytona 500. I yep. mean, it's just, yeah. you've got the highs and the lows yeah. of it. And I worked with, and I, God love Tommy, yeah. man. He rolls with the punches yeah. and yeah. Yeah. I, and I, I worked it. with Tommy for five years in the cup series and I was on the nine car at Everham when, you know, Tommy senior got killed at Thompson, you know? So the next morning at Michigan, it was like, ugh, you, you know, yeah. What do you say? What do you, you know, what do you, what do you say? You know, you can't say anything. You can't, they're, you're at a loss for words. And, and I was, I got to be good friends with Tommy senior too. And Did he crew chief the car that day? I'm trying uh, to remember. I, don't, I think so. I'm pretty Did sure he, he really? stayed. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But like when we would go to Loudon and race, you know, the modified race was always there. The, mm-hmm. the best race of the weekend at New Hampshire. Still Motors. is. Yeah. So we'd always pit Tommy Sr.'s car, right? So Tommy Sr. would always be like, oh, we got cup guys today. You know, let's come in, take four tires instead of two. And, you know, so uh, we they were just a bu- we're just a bunch of freaking Keystone <laughs> cops, right? So we, the one time I remember he was around like top 10. And he's like, everybody else is going to take two tires or right rear or something like that. He's like, we got the cup guys today. Let's take four. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I'm like, come on, man. We're not like, yeah, we are, but we're not. Right. We come down and it felt like the longest freaking pit stop ever. You know, we lost so many freaking spots. And he's like, well, that didn't work out, did it? I'm like. <laughs> Well, you know, Tommy's like, to- Tommy Jr. talks us all up, right, to, to to the old man and thinks that we're going to blast off this 
you know, five second freaking pit stop. You know, we, we look like a bunch of Keystone cops out there and lose spots. And, uh, uh, but it was fun. I still have pictures of that too. Like the days when we pitted the, the, the yellow seven New York and, you know, we bought a, my dad bought a couple cars from Tommy senior, mm-hmm. you know, throughout the years. And there's actually like one car in our stable that runs Mahoning Valley still. That was one of, one of Tommy's dad's cars. And runs yep. to this day. That's yep. awesome. Yep. So what else you got? Yeah. What's another one? Well, well, speaking of speaking Tommy, of <laughs> Tiger Tom Baldwin, right and it's there autographed. It is, and it's autographed. Yeah, that's cool, and, man. You know, it's got the, you know, always got the sponsors on the back, and I think this one's from 1994. Move it this way a little bit yep. into the shot. There yeah. you go. Look but, at that. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. You know, you find you find these shirts, and this one just happened to be autographed. And, Flipping, yeah. Let's see the autograph. Show yeah. the autograph to the camera. God, look at the artwork on that thing, and the Tiger Tommy Baldwin. Yeah. Yeah, he so had that nickname for years. And he's still man. got the Tony's racing engines. You know, it's still popular down here in the South. A lot of these guys still run Tony's racing engines. You know, he got shot too, right? Like, oh, yeah. Some guys were trying to shake him down or something. He got shot and he still like dove in the car after oh, yeah. him as they were trying yeah. to, like, shit out of an action yeah, movie. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, so, old man Baldwin was crazy, yeah. man. So, Tommy, <laughs> Tommy Sr., I remember when he tried to qualify the, uh, Joe Falk 91 car at Richmond, the cup car. Yeah. Like the old spam car. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I always used to call it, well, people do call him, but the greatest show on earth, right? Yeah. Uh, so he gets in this cup car. He doesn't qualify. He's like, well, the car is a piece of shit, right? <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, come on, Tom. I'm like, you re- like, if you give me a good car, run it right up there with them guys. Like, all right, all right. You're right. just a modified guy, you know, at Richmond and Joe Falk's spam car. Like, the odds of making it weren't good to start, but right. he was always calm. He was a very confident guy. Oh, he was, yeah. He was the greatest, greatest show on earth. And I, I still to this day remember going up to, you know, the funeral up there in Long Island, and there were so many people yeah. up there, and it was crazy to see. You know, you got Mike Iwanisco, you got that whole Long Island gang up there, and mm-hmm. to to see how well he was respected, you know that that's the kind of things that stick with you. Is those kind of people that came into your life and me, you know, weren't there all the time, but still taught you lessons, and they didn't even know they taught you lessons, right? right? So. You know, just just to have the camaraderie and and got to know him and just another person on the list. I mean, there's there's so many, but he was it, a great guy. It's one of those things that uh, Chris Romano, who was just in here, a guest of ours, was talking about about there's no local heroes uh, anymore. You, you know, we're trying to get those local heroes, and I know what you're talking about. Tommy Baldwin was one of them. Yeah. Bob and Bill Park, Steve yeah. Park's father and uncle. You know, like. They are unfamiliar names to the mainstream racing world, but we know who they are. Yeah. You know, those are those those heroes. Yeah, it, it's just uh, it's amazing too. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I feel like even today with the NASCAR racing, is the, the fan base is a lot smaller than what it used to be. But you used to have the local heroes that would start in the modifieds or start in you know different late models and work their way up right and they'd have a fan following all the way up through right mm-hmm. and now these drivers kind of just pop out right they, it's like where'd this guy come from well he ran legends at charlotte right well they're 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 younger and younger yeah. so we like uh we, chris and i were talking about we are not we don't know the backstory we're witnessing the backstory yep you, you yep. know that's that's the other yeah. thing yeah uh it's that connection too that i think that Larson and Bell and Ryan Priest are it helps with them because they came from the short tracks. They had a following on yep. those short tracks. Yep. So, you know, those fans came along with them. All these new kids that are coming along, they run at their local track for a year, they win one race and then they're off in a series somewhere. Yeah. And then yeah. after that they're trying to move up the yeah. ladder. And then sometimes they're they're just a flash in the pan. Like mm-hmm. they like you can see these kids winning these late model races and then all of a sudden they're like, Well, I I won a late model race at Hickory, so that means I'm ready for a truck series ride. Mm-hmm. So they're going to get all this money, and they're going to get a mediocre truck series ride, and they're just going to flop around out there and never get that opportunity again. It's- do you think that it, being that you've been around this part of the sport, do you think that like what Ryan Priest did was way smarter and buy one or two rides with a really good, solid team than... Because 
here's the thing. We've seen it happen on both levels. Like Alex Bowman flopped around in yep. second rate teams for a while and then eventually got hired by Hendrick. Same thing happened with Ross Chastain. Uh, you know, Priest, he put money into a good team to run one or two races to prove himself, and he did. Yep. You know, so yep. which do you think is the better way to go? Well, I feel like I was talking about this the other day after the Dover Xfinity race, right? Ryan Truex Jr., okay? Ryan Truex. He's not a junior. Right, Ryan Truex. Well, I just like saying junior. Ryan Truex Jr. Yeah. Just because he doesn't like it. He, he doesn't so, like it. Yeah, so Ryan Truex Jr. Uh, is home track, Dover, Delaware, right? They He wins the race. Now, it's taken 10, 12 years, right, since he won his uh, K&N championship. Two K&N championships. Two K&N, back right, to back. Right, So yeah. does that give you a false hope when you win a championship in, say, ARCA now where there's – five cars you know like if you're a william salmich or you know like those kind of guys they're they're race, racing these arca races jesse love you know the competition is very nil right so when you win those races in top equipment does that give you false hope that you're ready for it right i get you, what you mean right like okay. okay ryan ran three races for three or four races for gibbs that year mm-hmm. he won two of them right i think bristol and iowa I, I, I believe you know and then finished second in the other one right yeah, yeah. so all of, you're but you're in the best of the best right so you're a good driver you got the best equipment you should go out there and perform to that level or else you're not even going to be thought of mm-hmm uh, not saying that this guy's a bad driver, but Joe Graff Jr., right? He gets put in a Gibbs car. You're automatically, you should be a top 10 guy or top five guy. Not really. Mm-hmm. So that just separates you f- from that level. Now, is it a false sense of hope for Ryan Truex? Or is it good for Ryan Truex? Like Ryan Priest still is, you know, took him a couple of years after the Gibbs stuff to find his niche in cup racing at a solid organization. Mm-hmm. Right. JTG was a solid organization, but it's not SHR. Right. And the season so far, is it great for Ryan priest? I don't think so. Mm-hmm. Probably not up to his goals and his expectations, but With a team like that, but you have the team. It's right? going to come. Right. Though, I think. Yep. Yep. But that, false sense of like i'm ready because i was in the best car with the best equipment and i'm a good driver isn't going to happen all the time you're going to run into you know snafus a little bit in in lesser equipment right right? so it's easy to understand that uh uh what you're talking about because you have you know if you're in the best car the best handling equipment and very little competition it's going to give you that false sense of yep. okay i can do this yeah i, yeah, I and now understand ryan, where that's coming yeah, from but i know ryan like when ryan ran those races exception for iowa which was a standalone race mm-hmm. there was competition in in them other races mm-hmm. i mean i was you know we ran that 22 xfinity car and we had an all-star group of people we had brad keselowski joey Logano, ryan blaney alex uh, Tagliani like Sam Hornish we had all these good guys and every week we'd have different guys that we'd always run up front mm-hmm. right but you have the the best of the best right so if you can beat those guys uh, that's I think that's where you gain the most respect and and I think Ryan gains a lot of his respect in the fact that he works on the cars like his modifieds, he builds them. He knows them. He mm-hmm. knows ins and outs of he race sets cars. Them up. And that, I think, is what Tony Stewart, Kevin Harvick, and these guys. That's what got him that ride. I feel like that his, he works on his own. Stuff. His roots. I keep trying to tell these young kids that come on this show, work on your stuff, even though you don't like working on it. Work on it because yeah. you learn it. Yeah. Whatever you learn or whatever you know gets programmed in here now isn't coming out yeah. i mean the you know the old saying knowledge is power so yeah. you you know whatever you learn cannot be taken yeah. away from you and, so i tell these kids to yeah. watch and learn all the time yep. and i think you can't you can't make your goals attainable right like you can't come in the beginning of the year and say i'm gonna go out there and kick everybody's ass mm-hmm. because this is who i am mm-hmm. make 
make attainable goals and, and, and work those steps of, of racing. Because if you set those high standards, you have to live by them. And mm-hmm. if you don't live by your own high standards, well then, you know, that's going to be a, a problem. Right. But I see a lot of these guys, you know, just flash in the pan mm-hmm. guys, you know, yeah. and they're here and then they're, they're gone. You know, maybe they'll win a race or two, but you know, it's just, I just feel like it's sometimes it's just, we'll see what happens. right? Yeah. We'll see what happens. Right. But that like the Arca series nowadays is just, I don't, I don't feel like you learn much. I mean, Why is that? Well, it's just some of the races, say Michigan, you'll have a lot of cars mm-hmm. and, and you can learn having those five cars. You go to these short tracks where there's the guy that finishes fifth is seven laps down. Right. Mm-hmm. So, what are you learning against those four guys that you're racing with up front that you can't learn at well, Caraway or Hickory? Well, I, you know, to to be honest and to defend the Arca slash K and N series, I, I mean, I was in that series for a long time yeah. as the reporter yep. from uh, 2008 up into 2020, and yeah, th- there were. You know, oh, there yeah. were some good, solid oh, yeah. drivers that came yeah. out of there. I mean, look at, yep. you had uh, Corey LaJoy, you had Larson, yep. you had Benedetto, Moffitt. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, so they're, they're, they're there. Yeah. How, how can I, yeah. Like, the, just the current, the current day stuff, you know, it's. Is it, it because it's getting so expensive? I think it's just, yeah, I mean, you had, you had all these Gibbs and all these development teams come in and, and raise the bar, which raises the price of everything, which raises everything right so you Mm -hmm. still had the venturinis which they're a solid team and they give people opportunities and those guys Corey heim like all the you know they need that seat time right Mm -hmm. so i feel like it's still a good stepping stone is it you know is it the best maybe maybe not but it's it's the only other thing other than say trucks in the business sense though with these teams uh Obviously, you know, these teams are in business to stay in business yep. compared to needing someone that's talented. Like, how do you run that balance between we need to get paid drivers in here to keep the doors open, but we also need to show what our equipment can do? How yeah. do you how do you ride yeah. that balance? Yeah, I don't like it. It's a it's a happy medium, I guess, because like Venturini, I think it was more of a like a Toyota development Mm-hmm. ground right but so they are businesses but so they they've got to keep yeah. the doors open yep. so they have you know if you got to put the the brightinger girl in there and she brings money even though the performance isn't there you know to a top five level it's still a top 10 level mm-hmm. and you're getting money to keep everyone employed to keep you know so it's a it's a fine line between you don't want to just hire somebody for their money mm-hmm but sometimes you got to do that. Sometimes. You know what? I, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to ask Bill about this because he's going to be coming on the yeah. show. We're going to talk to him because, yeah. you know, as far as the ARCA teams go, like Venturini Motorsports is the Hendrick Motorsports yes, of ARCA, yes, yeah. you know. So I'm going yeah. to ask and him I mean, about And, I mean, they've this. won the last five races, I think. Shannon Roush, they, they've won the last five. And, you know, they're they're back to dominating that that series. And, you know, good for them. I, I've I've spotted for the Venturini Motorsports a couple times at the road courses, and it's a great group of people. You know, Bill and his wife are really great people. So mm-hmm. it's good to see that that team has still you know, perspired through all the changes, through all the years of doing it. I think I even saw Billy's run in a race. Really? Yeah. The, tell you, the Arca yeah. Series is, has yeah. come a long way because, you know, those were like cup cars, oh, yeah. you know, back in yeah, the day. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, they went through the evolution of being, you know, formerly of the Bush North Series yep. and then K&N, then yep. composite bodies yeah, came yeah, into effect, yeah. then the spec motors. Yep. And, you know, now we have uh, the cars that we have today. Yeah, and I remember, like you were talking, like the the, the heydays, the, you know, the 2000s and, you know, of ARCA slash K&N slash Bush North. You know, they're all combined now. Mm-hmm. But when you used to have those Bush North races with, you know, Matt Kobolak and Kelly Moore and all these guys would race like the Bush Series races, mm-hmm. that was so awesome to me that, like, the local, the local kind of guys, right. the, the Bobby Dragons and the Dave Dion, Ricky and Craven and too. Ricky Craven, it's actually yeah. what helped launch Ricky Craven's career. Yeah, yeah. Because so, just he would getting run those. a race with those guys, you know. Mm-hmm. And and I feel like they've they've made the rules now to where Cup drivers can't run but five races in Xfinity, five races in trucks. 
I think that's BS, man. You need to have those guys out there racing with those kids, teaching them lessons. Like, I just feel like that that's a key part of the the growth of the the guys that you're only as good as the competition you race with. Yeah, the yeah. guys that are good now in Cup raced with Cup drivers, mm-hmm. Chase Elliott, Alex Bowman. You know, those guys raced in the Bush Series or Xfinity Nationwide with Cup drivers mm-hmm. every week. Yeah. And then that takes the curve out of your your learning. I mean, you you learn so much. Right. No, I know what you mean because uh, uh, the same kind of principle but in a different subject setting because one time I was racing uh, the Outlaw Carts and was racing with Rico Abreu yep. and it was him and another guy in front of me battling for a position but I cause was watching him and I was learning how he would bring a guy down into yeah. the corner and I was like, oh, so that's what you do. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there, there is that. Yeah. I, I get that. I just think it's a, it's a, something that's missing in the in the trucks you know you'll get a kyle bush you know in there once in a while and i i've been lucky enough i spot for kbm at their non-companions and say like i did texas for them with jack wood but Mm -hmm. like when you have kyle in that truck like last year at sonoma you just watch all of his moves and it's just he's just toying with these guys And, and and if you're the guy in second and you're watching what he does on restarts, on whatever. Like, it's just a whole learning experience. It's an like education you, you can't buy. I, wa- I was spotting from the front straightaway on top of the media center at Sonoma. And on the restarts, you could just watch him mess with the guy that was second. And it, by the time you started, he would go he would go, and he'd just he'd be five car lengths ahead of him by the start-finish line before, you know, you even get started. You're even in the turn one. And it's like Ron Hornet used to be a great restarter and people would learn from him. Mm -hmm. So you, you got these guys that just, it's free education. Mm -hmm. If you're racing against those guys, whether you use it or not, it's there for the taking. But when those guys run those races, I feel like you need to watch and learn. Because you're learning from the Jedi Masters, yeah. really. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Right. So, uh, what other stuff have you got with you? We saw yeah. some of the. Yeah. We saw some championship rings, and we got. Uh oh, I see the I familiar orange. Yeah, there this we go. is a. Hold it in front of you this way a little yep. bit. This is the, uh, that. Yeah, Richie oh, wow. Evans. It's a Bruce Roll uh, original too. Look so at it's the artwork in that. Yeah, so it's just like the uh, <laughs> Reggie Ruggiero one, but mm-hmm. Bruce Roll is a guy in New York, and he still does. Yeah. He That's still cool. does a lot of design work, wow. you know, throughout the years. This one's from 1979. <laughs> so, yeah, it's way back when. But uh, That shirt could talk, right? Yeah, yeah. And I have a couple more at home. Like, he used to have Reg, uh, Richie Evans used to have pig roasts. Yeah. They're annual pig roasts. And mm-hmm. I have ones that are just pig roast shirts. You know, really? like, it's just when I find Richie Evans stuff, I buy it because, again, you have to know if it's real or fake. Yeah. For one. But you'll never find it, right? Right. It's it's not stuff that's 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 just out there. So so let's get get to the bling. Let's see the rings. Oh yeah yeah yeah. yeah. So we got, uh, you know, Daytona five hundred. Wow. Uh, this is two thousand twelve. Yes, so that's holy cow. That's heavy. That's yeah. That's that's really heavy. Well, it's like these rings are trophies to me, right? So when they give you the sizes of these rings, I get the. Uh, NFL player size, right? Like, I don't get the size that fits my finger. Oh, yeah. I, I just going to say, that's a big finger. Well, well just, you're a big dude. Yeah, but, like, I just get the, this one's 2009. This is, this is 2018 Daytona 500. Yeah. Okay. They got your name on it. That's yep. kind of cool. Yep. So, I always go for the biggest finger you can get <laughs> because it's a, I'm not going to wear this thing to McDonald's. So, right. I'm just going to wear it. Wow. How many it's, diamonds are in here? Oh, I don't even know. Yeah. There's a shitload of yeah. diamonds in here. <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah. It's uh that's a lot of bling, man. Yep. Okay, Daytona twenty two thousand nine champion. Yep. That was yep. with Kenseth. Yep. Your uh you don't have your name on this one? Uh, I think it's etched in the inside. Okay. They're all etched. I don't want to take it out or touch it. Oh, you can take it out. It's, it's like it's oh, fine. Okay, yeah, okay. take it out. Yeah. It's like, you know, touching something yeah, really no, no, precious no, here. No. You just they're stuck in there pretty good. Yeah, I was gonna say out. they do a good job. Yeah. Wow, that is heavy. Yeah. That is and super heavy. Like the years, uh, the first year, 2029, yeah. that we won is a different kind of ring, right? Like it's a solid, heavy ring. And then after that, the 
the years 2012 it turned into like a class ring well here's the sort thing. of you, you'll know you, you'll know if a guy down the, the road from you stole this yeah yeah, yeah 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 <laughs> wearing my little tree shirt be wearing my rings <laughs> you'll yeah. definitely know somebody yeah, yeah. robbed you with this <laughs> yeah. thing god yeah. i cannot get over the weight yeah. of this thing that's yeah. huge and then we got the indy 500 which oh, which the uh wow. at the indy 500 there's the traditional ring which is the one i have on my Hand. Oh, that's that's the one. Yep. So okay. that's a traditional uh, that you know you can wear around, right? Because it's not big and gaudy. And right, right. And and then that's the like the showpiece right. one. And I think I got like a size two thousand twenty or something like that. Indianapolis five hundred champion. Wow. This yeah. is this is it's a piece of history. Yeah. You, you you realize? I mean, yeah. everything you have here on the table is a piece of history. Yeah, this is just incredible yeah. stuff. And um, okay, let's uh, let's get to the plugs. Like, where can we find this? Where can we locate all of your stuff and yeah. buy? You know, where can we bring some business your way? Yeah, it's uh, just days gone by vintage dot com. If you put that in your searcher, you mm-hmm. know, your server, it'll pop right up. It's an Etsy platform store. And then also D A Y. Yeah, D A Y Z. D A Y Z. Yeah, because you know my last name is Went, so I had to put the Z in there. So. Gotcha. But uh, yeah, it's just a little small store, and I keep probably three hundred or so items in there. Okay. You know, and, and as things sell, I'll refresh it. If I find a big lot of stuff, I'll refresh it. But uh, you know, like these throwback weekends and things like that, a lot of things sell. So I'll be refreshing the store here next week. Uh, well, I got to look through some yeah, of your stuff because yeah. we need to, we love like old style t-shirts oh, yeah. or just, yeah. you know, nostalgic stuff. And then stuff. there's so much other stuff that I have that's on shelves that, that isn't even on the store. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I don't have a brick and mortar, but my race shop has a corner just dedicated to this stuff. Well, you might appreciate this then. This uh, We have a little piece of history I keep on the table here. This is one of the railing holders from Victory Lane at Concord Speedway. Oh, there you go. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 this, yeah. This has got a little history yeah, to it too because I was the track announcer yeah, there yeah. for a lot yeah. of years. And to see that track went away oh, was heartbreaking. Man. But at least I got yeah. a little piece. And I also have some of the grandstands from yeah. the place. Too. We don't buy from Copart. Yeah, we don't buy from Copart. I know because I go for the LKQ if I need to buy anything from a junkyard. Yeah, so they've what they've closed three tracks, right? And then they tried to do uh, Grandview, which is close to my home, Grandview Speedway, a dirt track. Mm-hmm. They were in talks of buying that last year, and thankfully, throughout the zoning processes and everything else, the town or you know the county said, Shh, "No good, we ain't doing it. We're gonna keep keep racing." So that was one that got away from the old Copart uh, wow. people, but uh. Yeah, I mean, all this stuff is on there. Uh, most of this stuff here. That is Days is Gone By Apparel. Vintage Apparel. Vintage Apparel yep. on Etsy. Yep. Okay, yep. cool. You don't have a Facebook page? No, nope, no Facebook. Twitter, uh, Instagram? Twitter's the same thing as Days Days Gone By. Is the uh, It's on Twitter, yes, and Instagram. Mm-hmm. Uh, same, same, you know, wording. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's on those three. No Facebook. I just... Too much crap goes on on Facebook, you know. So uh, sometimes, you know, I just dude. So I try to I'm, embrace the Facebook. I'm I'm telling you because you know Matt Dillner has drilled it into my head. A bunch of others like social media is yeah, like yeah. your hand. Yeah, you, yeah. you know, like you got Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, yep. Snapchat. Uh, uh, what else is out there? Uh, uh, TikTok. Yep. Yeah. 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 All of that stuff. It's yeah. just another way to, to reach people yeah. and to get in I contact. I feel like, you know, Facebook's probably pretty... It's, I've never ventured into it. I feel like I've got so much other ones going on, but I feel like Facebook is would, would do well if I took the time to plug it in there and have some time to, to, to mess around with it, I guess, which... I got a lot of time in the hotel room, so I could probably, <laughs> I probably could find the time, I'm sure. So, awesome. but yeah, but uh, yeah, it's all on there. Most of the stuff I showed you today is personal, personal collection stuff, but this is basically what we have, you know, in the stores, these right. kind of items from, it's, from the short tracks to your local home track to Indianapolis to Daytona, you know, and in between, we got all of it. Cool. We're getting uh, close to the end of the show, but where are you going to be at this weekend? Who are you well, spotting I, for? I, this weekend I have off. I will leave Monday morning to fly to Indianapolis well, for right. two it's weeks. the month of May. Yeah, for two weeks. We'll live in the uh, hotel there and and um, have the Indianapolis 500 and, you know, a couple Sundays from now. And which driver are you spotting for uh, again? Colin Eilat. He's a uh, number 77. It's a... Uh, Junco's hauling and racing. So yeah, we uh we had a decent test um a couple weeks ago mm-hmm. and 
you know, got a couple of things to work on, but you know, go out there and do our best and, and, and be there at the end is, is the whole key. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to be at the airport, uh, on standby when the race is still going on. You right. want to, you want to take your original flight. Well, yeah. we are going to be definitely cheering you and Colin on in the yeah. Indy 500. Yeah. We definitely hope nothing but the best for you guys. Yeah. And man, if you bring back another ring, you definitely got to come back on the yeah. show and we, tell us about you it. You got to be in it to win it. I say, so, Absolutely. Uh, you know, just, grateful for the opportunities grateful for the people that have got me to where i am and uh you know i appreciate you guys having me on no we appreciate you coming on and we'd definitely love to have you back so check it out brent wentz's store days gone by historic vintage apparel that's d-a-y-z it's on etsy it's on twitter we want to thank him for coming in and as always we'll see you the next time bye 